Well, our next uh, presenter is Caroline, mm. Dr. Caroline Jacobson. She studied for a long time. She gets to be called Dr. Bridie, you're a doctor too. Um, and Bridie's going to be talking about an issue that I deal with every year. Every year I get lots of questions if it's a bad season or a good season about you mortality. And it breaks people's hearts. Um, and I think also, as, the, as I just said about the value of the value proposition of sheep, as the value of the ewes gone up, so too is people's interest in the, uh, in the impact. And we certainly see that when we do our, our measuring, our financial measuring. If you're going from 3% to 4% debts, we're seeing that at the bottom line at, a, at $200, $250 a pop. Now, Caroline uh, is a researcher and lecturer at Murdoch Uni, and she's always great um, to talk to because she's worked on lots of different projects. I've rung up about uh, sheep abortions, water quality, and she's part of this team at Murdoch that are fantastic. And it's really great to have, have the team there, Serena and Tomo and all these guys, because there's just a lot of information that's lurking in the background there that you can uh, get hold of. So, Caroline, thank after you. you. So, thank you. It's great to be speaking to a room full of humans. A lot of our teaching at the moment is into a little green dot on our computers, so it's lovely to have some feedback. But I'd say the highlight for me for today is seeing all these great young people coming up and just nailing these talks. So well done, and the fact that they're Murdoch grads makes my heart sing. <laughs> makes me feel old. I'll have an existential crisis later, but I'll call Brown and I'll tell him that the the future's in good hands. So what I'm talking about today is um, bringing you the results from an MLA project which has been running over the past three years, focused on new mortality. So the background to this was that there was, um, I guess, pressure at an industry level that there's this um, frustrating level or this frust frustration around advisors and clients around new mortality, this perception that it's very variable and quite unpredictable. So just looking around the room, um, again, we've got a lot of people managing a lot of sheep here. Um, can you put your hands up if you've got clients where it's, an, you know, it's a problem in some years and it's very hard to predict? Is this the general consensus in Western Australia? Look, this is interesting because, again, a lot of the noise that was coming for this project was really driven out of... Um, out of the south southeastern Australia, and it was really focused around um, non merinos. And at the time, the conversation went around that, that we know everything that there is to know about merino use. We don't know much about non merino use, and so we're going to go ahead and do this um, this project to non merino use. And I want to put the question to you at the end of this talk: How much do you think you know? about merino use, because I think this is something that we need to feedback. So again, the background to this project was around this um, unpredictable and variable, um, I guess, issues with new mortality. The questions are, where are our benchmarks? Are our, the benchmarks we're using now appropriate? Where can we be doing better? And within that, what are the major issues and are there, are there actions that we can be doing on farm now that'll make a difference? So again, it was a research project um, determining the mortality, but particularly over the lambing period, so not overall ewe mortality, um, identifying the causes and factors that contribute to that. So the work I'm talking to you today was done on 51 farms, and again, I'll show you where they were located, and it had two... I guess, arms to the project. The first was um, the producers or the farmers, the host farmers, were effectively counting the ewes into the project in their, um, when they were being allocated to their lambing paddocks, so basically a head count at that point. And from then on, they were maintaining paddock diaries um, every time they were checking the ewes to count deaths, OK? Now, they were instructed that when they're involved in the project not to do anything to change their management, so no extra inspections, and to basically go around um, the approach to the season that they would normally take. Any ewes that did die, OK, that they picked up on their, their daily or, or bi-daily or whatever it was, the inspections, um, they were asked to record the cause of death in the diary. And again, that's just based on their best guess. A subset of um, ewes underwent postmortems. So vets would actually go out and visit each of the study farms at least three times during, uh, like during lambing. 
And in the course of that, we did um, 595 postmortems, which in hindsight doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually a monumental amount of postmortems. So that represented about 15% of the ewes that died overall. And so obviously the vets did the postmortems, they made their observations, and where it was justified, um, samples went off for further lab testing. There was egg counts that got done on a subset, and um, eye mineral, basically eye fluid analysis, looking for metabolic disease. So the farms were monitored over two years. Um, some farms were monitored in both years. Some farms we dropped out over the first year and replaced them. So about 40 farms, 40 or 41 farms in each year. And overall that represented, well, between 100 and 120,000 ewes um, over the two years. So most of the farms were located in southeastern Australia. We had six to eight farms in western Australia. Um, and again, we, um, Murdoch, managed those farms. But I'm presenting the results today for for all of Australia. So again, you're going to be interested in like the main outcomes. So we looked at the, the quartiles. Um, so the average mortality, so this is ewe mortality between allocation to their lambing paddock all the way through to, to marking, was 2.5% um, in 2019. So that was a pretty tight year, particularly in Victoria. And then 2020, they had like a bumper year. So it was down at 2%. But just looking again at the quartiles, the top 25% were doing less than 1.5% in both years, and the bottom 25% were doing sort of somewhere between 2 and 6%. So again, you can see that there's quite a variation between the bottom and the top, probably not surprisingly. So the main risk factors for mortality when we've gone through and um, done the, I guess, the more detailed analysis, looking at, like, is it age? Is it, um, you know, the, the litter size, like the number of lambs that they've got? Um, you know, factors that we can look at in the paddock. The only one that really came out was triplets being higher than singles or twins. So when we, again, when we take out the farm variation, there wasn't actually any major difference in the mortality of the single and the twin-bearing ewes, but the triplet ewes are much higher. Now, keeping in mind that this is a non-merino ewe project, so we've got a lot of composites in there, quite high scanning percentages, so that's where we're seeing high numbers of triplets coming through. So um, Andrew Thompson's also managing another project for MLA that's looking at um, managing triplet use um, for their survival and for the lamb survival. And again, that data in um, merinos and non-merinos is showing very similar results through Western Australia in that, that those ewes certainly have higher mortality as well as their lambs. Again, we asked the, um, the host farmers to record the cause of death in their diary. And when we've gone through the diaries, the most common cause in both years was lamb stuck, okay? So where they've obviously found evidence that a lamb was stuck or where um, in some cases they've pulled, you know, had a ewe down, pulled the, pulled the lambs and then found that ewe dead the next day. Um, so again, that was somewhere between, uh, somewhere between 25 and a bit over 30% over both the years. So that was the major cause identified by farmers. The next most obvious, um, the next biggest number was no obvious cause, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then after that, we had um, things like cast. And in hindsight, I think a lot of producers were putting down cast when the ewes were down and couldn't get up, but they weren't cast in the traditional sense of use being stuck on their side. And again, we've got smaller numbers of things like prolapses, metabolic disease. Again, that's based on the farmer's best guess and so on. And again... Metabolic disease prolapse? Yeah, but keeping in mind it wasn't actually diagnosed, so it was their best guess. And in some cases, I know the farmers that I was working with, if they had ewes that were down and couldn't get up, they'd give them a four-in-one treatment, and if they were dead the next day, they would put them down as metabolic disease. So I think, who knows, OK? Um, when we went through and analysed, like what, again, what were the main risk factors, one thing that did come out was um, of the farmer-recorded causes of death, that the ewe lambs, so these are ewes that are joined in about seven to ten months of age, lambing at around one year old, that they were at high... Of the ewes that did die, those were more likely to be dying from dystochia. But coming back to is dystochia a problem in new lambs, remember earlier I said that there wasn't a real age factor. So, again, we've got to go back and be quite cautious about that analysis that there's... Um, do you know what I mean? That it's not, 
It's not a given that ewe lambs will die from dystochia, but if they do die, then that's something that we really need to be considering. And I'll come back to that because we've since done some more work on dystochia on its own and, and new lambs certainly play a role in that. So like I said, there was a subset of, um, of, of animals, about nearly 600 post-mortems that were done by veterinarians. And that represents about 18% of the overall animals that died. So it's actually a reasonable sample. So what I'm going to be talking about now is the characteristics of the ewes that died, that we did the postmortems. So again, there was a big range in age, but the older ewes were overrepresented, and again, that's because we know that the older ewes are at high risk of, um, of, of death in general. And again, um, most of the ewes that died were twin-bearing ewes, but again, that probably represents the proportion in that most of the ewes in the study were twin-bearing. So for the vet postmortems, again, the big, and, and it was probably not really surprising that dystocia or dystochia was the, the main cause of death, but what was surprising was the magnitude of that. So again, between the two years, quite, quite different years, somewhere between, again, um, let's say 25 and 40% of the postmortems that were done were, um, were, were dystochia. And again, um, basically these numbers don't add up to 100 because some ewes would have had a diagnosis of more than one condition at, at at death. So after dystochia, the other important things were septicemia, which is blood poisoning, and trauma. And in most cases, the blood po or the septicemia or the blood poisoning or the trauma were probably secondary events that occurred due to dystocia. So basically the ewes had a prolonged lambing or a difficult lambing, and then the damage that was caused by that either left her susceptible to infection or that the trauma, basically she ended up dying from the trauma that was related to that. Hypocalcemia was an interesting one. Um, I think we see hypocalcemia certainly in Western Australia causing big issues on some farms and in some years. And again, would that be the feeling with the managers in the room? I think what happened is we, we didn't really capture those farms in those years. And I'll come back to hypocalcemia because it can be a tricky one to really sort out from the other problems that we're seeing on farm. So certainly where we're seeing hypocalcemia events happening in late pregnant ewes, um, you know, that, 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 that can be one issue and we certainly do see that as a problem in Western Australia. But what we're really talking about is ewes that die during lambing and again hypocalcemia certainly played a partial role in that. So again, coming back to that cause of death, we've got the dystochia or the difficult births, and so these were often used when, when, when we've done the post-mortem exam, we've found the lambs either stuck or we've found like recent trauma associated to, to the ewe giving birth. But then we've also again seen the septicemia and trauma, and when we pull those together that we see those representing like uh, the, the major proportion of the ewe deaths. And again, none of these things occur in isolation. So when we've got ewes which are having a difficult or a prolonged labour, the, what happens is while that ewe is, is down, she's more likely to suffer birth trauma, and I'll go into that in a, in a minute. But the most common ones that we saw were a ruptured uterus, so where a lamb, usually a lamb's leg had basically gone through the wall of the uterus, and then the ewe either bleeds out straight away or then dies probably two to three days later from the infection. They can develop... Um, basically the blood poisoning which, or the, the infection, so metritis or infection in the, the uterus. So these would be used that would die probably in the two weeks after lambing. And then we can um, sometimes see like just rupture of the other organs as well. So again, um, when we put those all together, it's um, really showing us that the, the problems are occurring at the time of birth. Interestingly, when we did... I used to live in Guildford. I used to live about 500 metres from here and we had this thing called the Guildford Pause. So you'd be there with your neighbours and you'd be having a drink and the planes would go over and you would pause mid-sentence and then as the plane had gone, you would continue your sentence. <laughs> and I just realised then that I, I, I've, lost, I've lost the Guildford Pause. I've, I've been away too long. It's distracting. Okay, so what, what we discovered is that when we were doing the veterinary postmortems, where we've opened the sheet right up to have a good look, that, um, again, 56% of them had obvious signs of, of dystochia and that if 
the farmer had gone by, picked the, the ewe up, put it in the ute, that they would have been able to say that was a post-mortem, so it's got a leg out or membranes or a lamb, sort of quite obvious there. But there was 44% of the cases that we diagnosed as dystochia that we wouldn't have known without the full post-mortem. So the message there is that for every one case that a farmer's picking up, you're probably missing one, okay? So when we talk to farmers, do you have a problem with dystochia on your farm? Okay, often they'll say yes, no, if they're not pulling lambs. But if you're not pulling lambs or not finding dead ewes with lambs hanging out of them, that doesn't mean that you're not getting problem with dystochia. So that, that's probably one of my take-home messages. Um, of the dystochias that we did find, um, nearly 60% were male presentations. So that might be um, you coming, like twins often, um, sort of coming out together, legs back, heads back and so on. And again, when we first started looking at this, um, you know, among the group of vets, they said, oh, well, you can't do much about that. You know, that's probably, you know, the dystochia that we can't do much about. But there are actually clear risk factors for malpresentation with lambs that are either oversized or undersized. So again, I'm going to come back to that. Like, what proportion of you deaths can we do something about? Is that there's this proportion of um, even dystochias that we know that we can do something about it. About 14% were just flat out um, fetal size. So that's that classic oversized single lamb, the, the, the lamb jam that we, that we probably think of when we think of dystochia. And then we've got, again, probably a quarter that were other things. But within that, we've got this uterus inertia, where the, the lamb is um, a normal size, it's normally presented, the cervix is open, and then the ewe is dead. And so we're like, well, why wasn't that ewe that able to give birth? And in a lot of cases, that's going to be metabolic disease, hypercalcemia, and so on. Again, the, the, you know, some of the big things that we had on that list were um, the blood poisoning or the septicemia and trauma, and again, the, the most common causes of the, the blood poisoning were either a uterus infection or an abdominal infection, and the abdominal infection invariably came from a ruptured organ, okay? So it was related to those difficult births. The likely, again, the likely origin of the trauma was where the uterus had become ruptured the, um, or, and the ewe had either bled out or her bladder had also become ruptured. So again, these are all related to dystochia. Hypocalcemia was only 10 to 15 per cent of the of the cases that we had, but again, I think that was a function of again probably the the the, the year and so on. Um, but but what we were able to work out is that there was higher risk in ewes over five years old, and I think that's something that's a pattern that we seem to see reported older ewes and ewes in low body condition score as well were overrepresented. Interestingly, though, of the ewes that, we, um, that had very low levels of calcium at the time of death, um, three quarters of them had at least one other condition happening. So we have to ask ourselves there, did that ewe die because of hypocalcemia or did she die with hypocalcemia? So she's down, um, like either a, you know, a dystochia or a difficult birth, or she's down and not able to eat and then her, her calcium levels drop just because she's in that precarious metabolic state. So again, I think hypocalcemia remains an unanswered question and something as advisors we need to, to be on top of, um, making sure that we're covering off on that in our specific systems. Um, in 2020, which was the good year in southeast Australia, we saw like a steep rise in these dorsal vaginal wall rapture. And I think one of my colleagues describes this as a, like a medieval torture cause of death. But it's basically, um, we tend to see it in these heavier ewes, multiple bearing ewes, where the wall, the top of the, of the vagina ruptures and basically the ewe just eviscerates and is found dead, um, basically with her organs hanging out. And again, this seems to be a season-specific issue. Again, the project was in... Um, non-merino ewes, so we were seeing it in heavier ewes, and certainly the ewes that were in body condition score over three and a half were overrepresented, high total fetal weight, so generally twins and big twins, and um, multiples in general. So the key messages from the project were there's some old and some new problems identified. I think the key message is that um, that the stoke is probably causing, or it is causing, higher you mortality than previously thought. And again, one of the feedback 
or one of the, the comments made from one of the producers who had a lot of post-mortems on his property said most of the cases that ended up being dystochia, he previously thought were pregtox or hypocal. So it was only when they did those detailed investigations and... Um, Again, he's working now, they're looking at their, their genetics, their Lamy's genetics and so on to try and address that. Um, I think the key, one of the key things that has really come out of this, particularly with the, the Victorian colleagues, is working out opportunities to manage our seasonality better. So what do we do in the good seasons and the poor seasons? Because they're quite different challenges. Importantly, we talked about, I talked about dystochia as being one of the important causes of the ewe mortality, but we've, we've been, in parallel to this, been doing modelling, looking at the impacts on lamb mortality, and this is probably where the big dollars are. Um, retrospectively, looking at all of the lamb postmortems being done in Australia, so um, we, we, we did a study of about um, 14,000 lamb necropsy records, and of those, of the Australian ones... Um, 53% of those had evidence of dystochia at, po at, at, at the point of death. So it's an important contributor to single-born lambs, but importantly also to twin and triplet-born lambs as well. Um, I think, again, if you'd asked me straight out of university, is um, like, where's this a problem? I would have thought that it's a problem in the single-born, you know, big, oversized single-born lambs and in those overfat non-merinos. But again, when we go back, big data set, like over seven or 8,000 merino um, necropsies, again, 49% of the lambs have evidence of dystochia. So it's a problem for merinos and non-merinos, problem for twin lambs, but we know that more twin... Sorry, problem for single lambs, but also because we've got more twin lambs dying, we also have more twin lambs dying from dystochia. So we've modelled this out with John Young and currently at a meat price of $6.50 a he, uh, kilo carcass weight, we know that lamb losses and ewe losses, okay, are estimating or causing $23 a head loss just from dystochia alone. And of that, only $2.50 of that is coming from the ewe mortality. So the remainder, about 90% of the reduced income, is actually from the loss of the lambs and not just of the ewes. I'm missing some slides, but I will... Talk to the rest, maybe. So the key, the key times, I was going to say, so what can we do about this? Basically, we've got, um, there's a little slide there, but the key times or the key, op the, the key times that we've got to be able to work to do something about this, the first is um, when we're purchasing rams and looking at our ewe genetics. So there are now ASB, or there, there have been for some time, but there are ASBVs out for lamb ease and that incorporates birth weight, but also whether, the ewes, um, whether they've had to have lambs pulled. So there's a direct lamb ease um, ASBV that's available for rams and for maternal sires, so rams that are going to be siring daughters that are going to be retained, there's a birth ease for daughters ASBV. So again, that's um, definitely worth considering and an ongoing discussion with um, with ram breeders or your ram supplier. The other opportunity at joining is particularly where you're joining new lambs is to making sure that new lambs have reached their joining or their target joining weight and then they make their trajectory, you know, that they're on schedule to make a trajectory to be an adequate size by lambing as well as at joining. The second time that we're really interested is um, body condition score and management, particularly through late pregnancy. And so that's when scanning and differential management plays a role because we can talk about ewe mortality being an issue, but they're not, it's not a homogenous issue across the farm. So we know that we're going to have young ewes that are at higher risk of dystochia, old ewes that are going to be at higher risk of metabolic disease, and having ewes that are over-conditioned is going to predispose them to, to dystochia, dorsal vaginal wall rupture and so on. Having them under-conditioned will put them at risk of conditions like hypocalcemia and pregtox. Again, one of the key things that we need to be looking at in late pregnancy is not just managing to the median or the, the average condition score, but looking at the outliers, because it's those outliers where the majority of mortalities that are going to be happening. So the over-conditioned scored use, so the use that are three and a half or above, and then the use that are in poorer body condition score. So again, the take-home message will be looking for the outliers rather than just the averages. 
At the point of lambing, what can we do about dystochia? And this is a big one, and it's quite, I wouldn't say controversial, but it's going to vary from system to system. So if dystochia is causing a big problem, do we tell farmers to go out, drive around the ewes every day, and start pulling lambs? Well, I would question that for a couple of reasons. And the first is, is that once you start driving into the paddock, the next thing that happens, you get out of the ute to pull out one lamb, you disturb three other ewes, and the next day those are the ewes that are dead with dystochia because the pregnancy or the, the birthing process has been interrupted. So we talk about this and we say how much intervention is the right intervention and I don't think there's a right answer for anyone. It's going to be based on how those ewes are used to being handled, the paddock set up, the mob size and whether you can actually go in and pull lambs without disturbing other ewes and creating more problems than you're creating. So I think Gordon Refugi has a good saying, people ask him, do you go in and pull pull lambs, and he says, once you start pulling lambs, you're committed to keep pulling lambs, because for every you you save, you're then going to sort of end up with this domino effect. So again, we've got quite, quite experienced people in this room. You've probably seen the whole gamut of people that are very intensively monitoring, people that are very hands-off, and sometimes it doesn't make a lot of difference in the end. So I say the hard work's done with your genetics, the hard work's done with your management in late pregnancy, and at that point, you can decide whether you're going to pull lambs, whether you're going to have a very hands-off system, but you've really got to commit to it, measure your results, and then come back and improve on that in the following year. I think that's the, the following message. So the targets that we have around managing that disturbance are mob size and supplementary feeding, which is the other, the other big question, like what's the best way to supplementary feed over lambing so that we're not disturbing ewes and creating more dystopia. So in hindsight, you know, in like the, the, the wrap-up for this story, um, dystopia is a big problem. Keep an eye out on the horizon. We've got genetic tools at hand. We've got management tools at hand. I'd encourage you to consider, again, looking for those outliers and managing, managing specific use separately. And keep the ongoing conversation because I think there's an opportunity for continual improvement in all of our farms. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. 365 on top of, so as far as that pink cost and uh, I reckon if we did this study again in Merinos, that the older age group would be, I, I think we would find that. And yeah. I, I can tell you, when we look, probably now you'll find older you, age groups on farms because people are probably retaining another age group mm. to try and build up numbers. But I know on some of the farms that I looked after, and, and again, these were on ewes which had plenty of hybrid vigour, the seven and eight-year-old ewes had some mortality levels that I wouldn't be advertising to the public and the wheels fell off very, very quickly. So um, I, I think if we did in marinos... One, one thing is, is um, in marinos, um, we'd probably get less triplets. So I think maybe some of those, those issues around the the trauma and the rupture we would probably see a bit less of, but I reckon we'd see more of the metabolic disease yeah. if we'd repeated that. But that fact is making sense in that people are feeding their sheep at conception so much better. Be yeah. Better so that obviously that percentage of twins, so even though it's a, it's a small amount of losses in the ewes, that, that would align with more triplets. Yeah, and once you scan, if your scanning percentages are getting up around that 160, 170, then you're getting triplets in there. Yeah, so. Um, just uh, something that came up, uh, particularly in a bad season when they're feeding pretty deep into the year. Yeah. With ewes uh, that have, they just have the land that, are, have, as you said, they don't have big lands. Yeah, yeah. But it's just sitting there and it's like they're caught halfway through the lambing process and it's just like they stop. We find a bit of that, and there's been talk about calcium. And yeah, and we rec I reckon that that is the big unknown with calcium, yeah. with hypocalcemia, and I think we're probably seeing more losses from that than the ewes that are dropping dead earlier. Um, it's really hard to measure, though, and, and we're trying to set up a study doing it but the, because the calcium levels fluctuate so quickly. You've got, you've got to be right there. But um, I think if we can 
get calcium right. I think that's where we see those improvements in lamb survival. And so what are our recommendations? Um, supplementation through late pregnancy um, can be like limestone and salt, limestone, magnesium and salt. And I think there's those ratios of one to one to two, which work just as well as the commercial mixes. But we've still not demonstrated improve. You know, there's not been enough studies to actually demonstrate those improvements in, in lamb and new survival. So um, I think that's our best bet treatment at the moment, though. Thanks, Caroline. This stuff's always fascinating because we always think we know what's going on. Yeah. Well, I think for the younger people here, I think it's important to put this all in, put this all in Well, they are when, you know, it's an interesting one. And I think when we talk about, say, improving lamb survival, uh, and I think improving ewe survival, what it offers you is the investment in isn't just in the value of that ewe, but it's retaining the genetics. And it's more than just the replacement value of that sheep, isn't it? Because it's... Um, point, it's probably hard to model out, isn't it? Yeah. My point was going to be, if you, if you talk about historically people, what about the big, big lambs? And I guess we've had these discussions this year with all the rain. Yeah. What's it going to do? But I still think um, new conditions for a lambing is still a primary driver of lamb production. And I wouldn't want people to go away with the wrong message to say, be careful, you don't want that use of lamb. If you do, no. That's the lesser of the two evils, and certainly my mind. So I guess I'm. That's what I was going to say to you. And that's my view. This is, again, I've probably been a dissenting voice with, with some, you know, because the caution when we take this out to an extension message and start talking about the risk with overfat ewes is what's overfat for a composite ewe in Hamilton, Victoria, is quite different to what we would see in a merino ewe in, in Calabaran. Okay? So the, I think where they are seeing the issues is those big fat ewes, which are probably in condition score four, which we don't really, we just don't see that in, in, in big wool cutting ewes. And my, my concern is, is that people say that and say, oh, well, we're not going to let them get too fat. And then you end up with issues with lamb survival because you're, you're getting three kilo lambs. So, um, I, and again, this, this issue with genetics is like, how far do you go with genetics around birth weight? I think what you need to be looking at there, and, and Andrew Whale talks about it quite well. He talks about taking out the outliers from your RAM team to try and hit that sweet spot more often. So trying to get those target birth weights, which are neither too big nor too small, and take out that variability within the, within the RAM team so that you can then feed more confidently, do you know what I mean, across, across the U base. So. You want to use it because you score four on right? Yeah. This is, this is the question, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It is, but it's not. It's not always the full picture. And certainly, again, um, I'll hopefully be talking to everyone about the fetal loss project. And one of the outcomes for that is that we'll be recommending is when people have disappointing marking results, is um, that they without disturbing the ewes, picking up dead lambs, weighing those dead lambs and um, doing some necropsies to see what's going on. Is it dystochia? Is it, is it something else? Um, but one of the issues with that is your weight is that survivor bias, yes? So you might be weighing, and I, I, I know this because I've been doing work on farms where we weigh all the dead lambs and they're like, oh, three kilos, three and a half kilos. And yes, those were straight out undersized starvation mismothering, but what you don't see is all the four, four and a half, five kilo lambs which got up, had a drink and are running around. And that's where I would say is that the issues there are managing, well, one, the outliers with the rams. You've got rams which are throwing, whoops, some, do you know what I mean? You've got outliers with your rams and then you've got outliers within your ewes. So although those ewes might have been managed to an average condition score three, I can say I've got 100 ewes there that are in condition score three, but 50 are in two and 50 are in four. 
none of them are in condition score three. And that's the issue with managing to averages. It's, I think we need to be managing to targets and then like looking at those outliers within that. So, so yes, it's a good start, okay, but, but the risk there would be is if you were picking up small lambs, do you know what I mean, then feeding and then ending up with, with issues, which is rarely going to be a problem with merinos, but certainly could be with the composites. Yes, if I was an observation, That's exactly right. And I, I mean, I don't want to say it, but we had, I had used in this project where I didn't end up doing any post-mortems because they just don't die. Do you know what I mean? We're saying you couldn't have killed those ewes over lambing and they're probably losing half a percent. Oh, so one of the slides that I didn't get into was the targets, okay? And so there were farms in there that were consistently across both years doing less, less than 1% new mortality. So there's um, good... Gen and I reckon, I reckon we'd see a big variation in merinos, and I reckon our WA merinos would be performing as good as any in Australia. I don't, yep. Well, I just react to that, I suppose. We've seen a lot of sheep to the eastern states breeding ewes that everybody knows Yeah. One thing I've learned in the last couple of years is talking to the buyers and consistently buy stock from our area and any other areas of the state. They're as good as they're buying Australia. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've said, I've said, and we have to buy the The huge huge centres are as good as anything we buy in Australia. Yeah. Probably under value of what we've got. I think so, and especially those. those. those studs that are just consistently like putting out tons of rams in the high end of the dual purpose index and we've you know I worked with some of some of those studs for the fetal loss project and those places you can walk around at lambing tagging picking up lambs um, and even with that they've got excellent lamb survival but again you look at the birth weights and um, very consistent um, and well managed as well but yeah yeah good good it's a really good point I'd love to do the Merino project, and I think <laughs> WA, should, do it as well. WA yeah. should lead it. I, again, I think I, I get a little bit frustrated. There's no criticism. I get a bit frustrated with these projects that look at youth survival or look at lamb survival. I think you have to look at it all together because it's got to be part of a system. Do you know what I mean? So if we're tweaking the system to address lamb survival, we've got to make sure that we're not causing issues at the other end. And similarly, do you know what I mean? It needs to be looked at as a system because we don't we don't farm in bite sizes. We farm. We farm. We farm yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Well, I think there are a couple of really interesting, well, a lot of interesting things yep. there. But the fact that a lot of the stoky just don't know the yeah. stoky, and and B the fact that you just have the conversation about people going in with their mob of sheep, and I'm more about not disturbing the you and the lamb, the fact that you're actually affecting the birthing process as well. Yeah. It's, it's fascinating. That's just another, it's another, nail, another nail in the coffin of going around the use that lamb. So I don't want to hold everyone up at dinner time, but we are doing the extension stuff. So um, what I would like to see that we can give to you is a, is a fact sheet, you know, around what are the tools in the, in the toolbox and almost like the producer guide and then a fact sheet for... Um, you know, for your clients, do you know what I mean? Like the, the, the top five key messages, but also, you know, the, like, you know, the infographics, like the five things that you can do. So the questions to speak about with your ram breeder, um, when should you be preg scanning? But, you know, and all, all these sort of questions. So I think it'd be great to get feedback because, um, because again, that can, can develop and evolve. And I think opinions involved in the project, and, and they'll do really well. Actually, there was one question earlier that I could probably help with, and it was about Erivac, about the, the arthritis vaccination. So there was, there was abattoir work done. Um, about half the um, arthritis cases going through the abattoir were um, erysipelas, and I can't remember how many thousands were that, that included, but about half the cases were erysipelas. I think after that, the next most common one was um, staphylococcal. So they're bacteria that would normally be on the skin. So have probably entered either through the navel or at marking. And then the next most common after that 
was a bacteria called Chlamydia pecorum. So um, we're starting to learn more about Chlamydia pecorum. Have I got one minute? You've got a minute. So, um, so again, in a separate project to this, where we were looking at the causes of abortion and stillborn in maiden ewes, this is completely new, is we found on the West Australian farms, we found this, this bacteria called Chlamydia pecorum in 50% of the aborted and stillborn lambs from, from Western Australia. It came completely out of left field. And the only reason we discovered it is because the laboratories have changed the PCR test that they do to exclude an exotic disease. So normally they test for a different type of chlamydia that's in other, just about every other country of the world and we don't have in Australia. And we picked up the chlamydia pecorum when we were trying to rule that out. So we picked that up in some flocks. Um, so some of these flocks had abortions, some of them just, it, it was in like stillborn lambs or lambs that were born and just never really got up and got going. And we followed those, that cohort through to slaughter and then lambs which were not fit to load, so these were lambs at sort of eight months age, you know, slaughter weight. And we took all of the ones that were not fit to load and we found chlamydia pecorum in every one of their joints. Now, we wouldn't have found that before if we were just culturing it. The only reason that we found it is that we had these very sophisticated DNA tests, okay? So probably within those 50% before, <coughs> when we had 50% erysipelas, we now think that chlamydia pecorum is probably overrepresented. So what that means is that you can do all of the right things for arthritis. So you can use clean yards at marking, the Erivac vaccine, and again, it has to be used appropriately. So the ewes are treated in late, late pregnancy, the lambs are treated again at marking. Mm -hmm. And then of these unknown ones, if you're still getting problems on the farm, that's where we think this chlamydia pecorum could be representing those extra ones. Now, the other thing with arthritis that, that came up is, um, you know, like, like, so I, I'm, I'm vaccinating, I'm using Erivac, and I'm still getting a problem. Well, the biggest risk factor for arthritis in sheep is actually tail length at marking. So leaving the three palpable joints actually reduces the risk of arthritis by something like, I can't remember, but half, okay? So it's the short tail docking has a much higher risk of arthritis. So again, if people are vaccinating and still getting problems, rather than being a vaccine failure, often it's related to other causes, and then dirty, mar dirty yards at marking, short tail length are probably the two biggest risk factors. So I think when we talk about arthritis, it's not one problem. There's probably three diseases. We can deal with one of them with vaccination. We can deal with all of them with um, tail docking, and the, the chlamydia pecorum is still working out and... We'll get back to you in 12 months, maybe, maybe we know a little bit more about what's happening. Fantastic. Well, yeah. we're all, yes. We have time up here. Yep. Well, it is afternoon tea, though. But... Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the other one we were talking about at the moment is Campbell Oh, yeah. Yeah. So for a lot of salespeople, it's an easy sell for the vaccine. Are we recording? <laughs> no, are we, is this recorded? Yeah. yeah. So um, we, we, again, in the fetal loss project, we've been looking at that and we'll be rolling some extension out. So we've got a couple of papers under review and once they are accepted, I'll send the, the results out widely. So for, for the Western Australian data for, for maiden ewe flocks. Every flock we test has Campylobacter, okay? There's two types of Campylobacter that they test. They all have the one that normally lives in the gut, so that's jejuni. C. fetus, we find it on most farms, some at high levels, some at low levels. Um, and when we did the postmortems, where we, we, looked, we looked really carefully for Campylobacter and didn't find any cases in our study flocks. Now, when we've gone back and looked through the lab results, Campylobacter causes big problems on some farms in some years, but not on every farm or in every year. So 
Um, we'll be rolling out recommendations about how and when to use the blood test, but I think the, the best outcome that we can come up with is almost a risk matrix for, a um, bit like what Bruce came down to, how high is your risk of Campylobacter? And it's going to come down to doing it as an insurance policy. So if you can't afford the one in five year, you know, the one in five year events, or you've got, you know, you've invested heavily into the genetics, so you couldn't afford, afford a big loss in one year, I think we make the decisions around that. What it's not going to do is give you this massive uplift in, in Western Australia in, in lambing rates. So it's one piece of the puzzle, but to put that in context, we didn't find we didn't find Campylobacter on any farms. We found chlamydia on every farm, and we know nothing about that. So, yeah. Excellent. Thanks again.